a very good evening to you. Welcome along once again to Sweet and Swing here on Max Radio. Friday night, 9 o'clock, my favourite time of the week, and I sincerely hope it's yours as well. What have we got? A few more takes on Cole Porter. The last of our gold standards American songbooks. Chick Webb and Ella. And to get us going, what do you think at the end of every episode of Sweet and Swing before the next one. It's been so long. Very nice, too. Good way to get going. I don't know whether I phrased that correctly at the beginning of the programme. Yeah, It's been so long, so that's what you actually think 
at the beginning of each show, isn't it? Not the end of the... Oh, I got it back to front, I think. Anyway, you know what I meant. It's a long time between shows, or it can be, because there's not a great deal else out there where you can get your fix. I suppose you can play your vinyls in your 78s, can't you? But there's not a massive amount of radio shows around, are there, playing this sort of music? I suspect there's a bit more... If you go searching, which I can't say I've really done on podcasts and such like, but nothing jumps out in the same way. I mean, Sheila Tracy used to do stuff, and there's bits on Radio 2, I think, which I haven't checked out for a while. But anyway, we're nice to be here on the Manx Radio, and it's certainly, I think I can say with hand on heart, the only show that concentrates on this wonderful music here on Manx Radio. Though, of course, if you do visit on a Thursday evening the wonderful Morris Trace with a little light music. You will find a little bit of crossover from time to time. And I know uh, we're working at the moment, Morris and I, on an Ivy Benson special. So, yeah, keep your ears peeled if you like that sort of thing. And Morris has got far more inside intel than I have on all sorts of things there. So check him out on a Thursday evening or any of the other wonderful specialist shows, be it brass band, be it opera, be it jumping in, whatever the case may be. The folk show with John, of course, wonderful stuff. Uh, the John Mark II, as we call him here, taking over the reins, uh, as he did so wonderfully earlier on after John Mark I retired after 40, God knows how many years, of wonderful folk music. And, yeah, great to have John carrying on that tradition as well, uh, with so much knowledge. Anyway, check any of them out, 9 o'clock on a Saturday night. Helen Ward getting us going here this evening on Sweet and Swing. Uh, and as Peter Dempsey wrote uh, back in the late 1990s, that back in the day, band leaders considered vocalists and this is in the early days, I think, of the big bands and swing band era, especially female vocus, vocalists, something of a liability. Don't think you're allowed to say that now, it's not PC. It was sufficient at the time then, as he, Peter says, to have a star instrumental lineup, and at least initially with Glenn Miller, Eddie Lang, Bunny Berrick and the Dorseys, the Tea Gardens, uh, Joe Sullivan, Gene Krupa, et al. Uh, Goodman could boast the creme de la creme, but with the Increasing exposure offered by rapidly expanding coast-to-coast radio networks, the human voice element steadily became more indispensable to the swing ensemble. And one of the uh, first to take this on was a man, and uh, in fact the exact lineup I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Chick Webb, who arrived with Ella Fitzgerald. What a lineup that was! And even before that, uh, Benny found his greatest asset. In this woman, Helen Ward. She was the, uh, yes, quite often known as the queen of big band swing. More so maybe even than Ella. Yes, probably was. And yeah, as Peter says, if Goodman was the king of swing, Helen Ward would be his queen. Born in New York back in 1916, she studied piano originally and voice and then sang professionally from the age of 16. A lot of these vocalists started out really early doors, working uh, as a pianist and vocalist with secondary bands before taking on the prime role with the Latin American band of Enrico Madruguera at the New York Waldorf Astoria in 1933. And of course, a romantic association with Benny Goodman as well. And that began in 1933 after he successfully auditioned uh, for radio, or auditioned Helen. Great voice, though, wasn't it? And as I always think when I look at this CD, she is the spit of Emma Callan, ex from the head of the Villa Gaiety, or perhaps Emma's the spit of Helen Ward. One of the two. Make, make of that what you will. Go and take a look on Wiki or online somewhere, and uh, if you know Emma, and take a look at Helen, see if you agree with me. How about a bit of boogie? Can't beat a bit of boogie on a Friday night, can you?
Well, he could play all right, couldn't he? Billy Penrose. Uh, born in Brighton, I think. Uh, I always think he's American whenever I hear the name. He's not. He was an English jazz musician, of course. He played piano, also played trumpet and started out with his own quartet, playing, as you heard there, rather effectively, Boogie Woogie, although just with uh, a trio with the sound of it there, with a bit of brushwork going on, wasn't there? I think it was a bass, uh, but not a quartet by the sound of it. Played with a number of bands, uh, forming his own quartet, as I say, when he was playing originally with Lou Prager and the boys. And... Boogie in the Groove, perhaps one of his better-known releases, such as they are, if you know any of them, uh, dates to about 1945, I think, Boogie in the Groove. Speaking of Boogie in the Groove, what about slowing it down a little bit? Wolf Phillips, and there have been some good moons of late, but I don't know if we've had a blue moon recently.
Well, that just floated along under its own power, didn't it? Very nice indeed. Blue Moon, Wolf Phillips and the All Stars. And as we were listening to that, I was reading uh, his obituary. I know that sounds a bit sort of uh, down, but let's face it, an awful lot of the artists we have on Sweet and Swing are no longer with us. Um, you know, time marches on, doesn't it? It's the way life works. But there's a wonderful piece written for his obituary in The Guardian. It's nice to see that he made The uh, Guardian and a very a lovely piece by Michael Friedland. Died back in August of uh, 2003 at the uh, fairly reasonable age, I think, of 84. A great piece by Michael Friedland and really highlights uh, his wonderful start and uh, a great character, as so many of these band leaders were. He says of all the big band leaders who featured in 1940s BBC in its most popular, in its influential and popular era, the sons of Jewish immigrants from London's East End were well up there. Uh, their parents had wanted them to play the violin or piano. The sons found they could make more money fronting orchestras. Not really a surprise, really. Uh, he had a successful brother, of course, didn't he? Sid. Phillips. So Sid, a successful band leader. Wolf, perhaps even better in many ways, although Sid is maybe the better known name, played on the wireless and performed with some of America's greatest names, went on to conduct at the London Palladium as well. Came from a musical family, of course, all three of his brothers had orchestral careers. Uh, Phillips wanted to get into the music business, so he joined a music publisher at the age of 14 with Campbell Connolly. And uh, as Michael points out, a firm whose stamp was seen at the top right-hand side of the label of countless popular 78 RPM records. He was a staff arranger for composers, oblivious that their work was in such immature hands. It was Sid then arranging for Ambrose, who taught Wolf how to orchestrate. And when Wolf came up with one piece of music, he sent it to the band leader who recorded it, thinking it was his brother Sid's work. Yeah, that's how good he was. Another little wonderful line that Michael has, who says... uh, if that sounds like a typical East End boy turned musician story, there was one difference. Wolf, unlike most of the inhabitants of Jewish London along the Mile End Road, was a cricket fanatic. Sid took him for lessons at the Aubrey Faulkner Cricket School, and he was even offered a contract to play for Lancashire. He must have been good, mustn't he? But realised that while cricket was a passion, his time as a player would inevitably, inevitably be limited. So he opted for music instead and just kept that as a passion. He went on to be a singer and a ranger for big bands and conducted rehearsals, Joe Loss, Harry Roy, frequently taking the helm when they were broadcasting. And uh, soon he was just playing for Ambrose, working with the band on the Moss Empire Variety Theatre Tour. Not bad, eh? For six years he played with the Royal Army Medical Corps Band as well. And a lovely little line here. He remembered a radio show from the days when Irving Berlin came along to hear his music. I must congratulate you, sir, Berlin told him. He called me Sir, Wolf would recall. Thank you. I was 25 years old. Not bad, eh? Went on to work at Ciro's with Ambrose. And then in 1966, singing in the rain star, Donald O'Connor suggested to Wolf, you could do all right working in California. So he and his wife went out and settled in Camarillo. And I think he did do all right work. He's an accompanist, musical director, sometime president of the American Society of Arrangers and Composers and conductor of the Camarillo Symphony and captain, even more importantly, as Michael points out, captain of the California Cricket Association. Good life, eh? Like so many of these characters. Wolf Phillips. Right, the last of our gold standards, classics from the great American songbook. We've been dipping in and out of this double CD for, oh, several months now, because there's all sorts of great names there, Bing and Anita and Ethel Walters and Doris Day and Lena Horne, Dick Ames and you name it. We'll finish off with, oh, what shall we have? How about a bit of Peggy Lee with Blues in the Night, the last of our gold standards. Take it away, Peggy. Um 
man's gonna sweet talk and give you the big eye. But when that sweet talking's done, a man is a two.
There's your twofer for this evening, I think. Um, that was Lionel Hampton, of course, 
with his all-stars going full tilt. Did you hear the piano? Up and down, up and down the keyboard like a, well, I don't know what. Baskets of coal, I think used to be the phrase. I can think of something ruder, but probably not appropriate for this programme. Uh, Art Tatum, yes, incredible at keyboard work in the background if you're listening to that. Lionel Hampton, of course, on the vibes. Harry Sweets Edison on the trumpet. Red Calendar bass and the burning drums. None other than Mr Buddy Rich Esquire. Lionel Hampton and his giants, what is this thing called? Love, uh, straight off the back, of course, of Blues in the Night. Beautiful reading, a little bit of scat from Peggy Lee. You're listening, of course, to Sweet and Swing here on Max Radio with myself, H. Always a pleasure to have your company on a Friday evening. Still to come, we will be having some, as I mentioned at the beginning, Ella Fitzgerald with Chick Webb. We've got our women in jazz as well. But before that, how about some Vera? Vera Lynn and Sam Brown with the Robert Farnan 8. And they're keeping the love light burning. <laughs> a bit of all right wasn't it very nice indeed our vera with our sam sam brown i don't know how often they i'm not aware they performed together on a regular basis was that their only recording together or am i missing a whole tranche of stuff they did which has just never come past my ears i don't know the answer to that one of course if you do know then uh, let me know howard kane and you can just email me. Probably the easiest way. Most people are on email, aren't they? Howard Kane at manxradio.com. C A I N E. Or you can uh, write, of course, to uh, Howard at Sweet and Swing. Manx Radio, and that's Broadcasting House. The one at the top of Douglas Head. You know it. Douglas Head. Douglas, Isle of Man. 
And the code is IM15, B for Bertie, W for Whiskey. Wouldn't mind one now, actually, but no, I won't. I won't. I'll carry on with the programme. A nice little collection, that. Uh, Vera Lynn um, and the notes here I'm just reading. It's got a little paragraph on it. This collection concludes with someone who might have reached the very top but who learned her craft in the world of dance bands. Vera Lynn had her first hit with Ambrose, the little boy that Santa Claus forgot. Ah, yes. But here her duetting with Sam Brown in I'll Keep the Love Light Burning. Doesn't suggest whether there was more of that, where that came from or not. So if you know, let me know, because we could maybe feature more. We more often hear Vera just singing on her own, don't we? So it's nice to hear her singing with another great vocalist of the time. And, of course, Sam Brown with his Manx links. Oh, yes, he did have his sweet shop down in Walpole Avenue after he decided to quit his singing career. Uh, we've been celebrating our little mini-series of women in jazz and some of them you won't have heard of, and some of them you will. The Women Classic Female Jazz Artists, 1939-1952, a CD I dug off the, the shelves and blew a bit of dust off. Um, one of the old maestros, many, which I've transported up to the Black Satanic Mill on the hill. Now, what about this lot? Hazel Scott with the sextet of the Rhythm Club of London. Mighty like the blues. <laughs> It's a mighty like the blues Won't somebody's friendship And it just don't matter who's Anyone can cheer you When you're lonesome with the blues I was full of the joy of spring Now I've lost my faith in everything Can't believe the gone But still I'm gonna spread the news I'm through with love forever, cause it's mighty like the blue. thinking of Mighty Like a Rose, which my uh, nana used to sing to me when I was very little. Mighty Like a Rose. Yeah, you know the one. I think we featured it on this programme before, to be honest with you. Hazel Scott. Again, not a name that might not, uh, might trip off the tongue readily. She did go on to some stardom. I'm just looking at the notes from this lovely collection and there's a, a lot of uh, annotated notes by the great jazz critic Leonard Feather, who put this collection together. Uh, Hazel Scott, he says, uh, she uh, piano soloist on the other track on the album, Calling All Bars, and vocalist on this track, the one we've just heard, Mighty Like the Booze. <laughs> like the booze? It's the whiskey that's making me think about booze, isn't it? Mighty Like the Blues. I should never have mentioned the whiskey. Uh, Hazel was born in Trinidad. She arrived in New York at the age of four with her mum, 
who for some years led an all-female band. Something of a child prodigy was our Hazel. Went on to study at Juilliard at an early age and in her late teens was already working in a Broadway show. A radio favourite by the 30s and in 1939 opened at Café Society when she would have been about 19, I think. And she became the club's most famous discovery. Went on to play in the movies and, according to Leather, Leonard, big time stardom. I can't place it, I have to be really honest, but maybe i am just got a blank spot somewhere. And she later married the congressman Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Good voice, though. Uh, reminds me of, who does she remind me of? I'm not quite too sure. One of the other uh, vocalists of the time, I thought she was very reminiscent, but I'm not thinking of who the name was. It'll come back to me at some stage. I enjoy that one. In any case, we'll uh, might play the other one from her selection on there as well. The the booze one, or oh, blues is actually, it's calling all bars. I don't know whether we're talking about booze bars or uh, other bars there. Ballet bars? I don't know. I don't know. Sweet and Swing with H. I promised you some Ella with Chick Webb. And here she is. And a great big basket full of rhythm tonight from the First Lady of Swing, Ella Fitzgerald. I'm not 
that handsome is too. Ah, oh, but when I look at you, uh -huh. I just, oh, Johnny, oh, Johnny, oh, Johnny, uh -huh. oh, Johnny, oh, Johnny, oh, hear me talking, oh, Johnny, oh. Oh, Johnny. Not bad. Ella Fitzgerald with Chick Webb and his orchestra. And I was just wondering who the Johnny is. It doesn't actually say who's singing there with her, you might know, but uh, I confess there's nothing on the recording to say who it actually is. As far as the song is uh, concerned, the inspiration for Oh Johnny, well, according to an August 1945 United Press article, the lyricist Ed Rose wrote the song when his friends and Mr and Mrs John Hansen of Akron, Ohio, began dating while attending college in Indiana. They were so conspicuously in love that Rose, also their classmate, wrote the song about them and presented them with the original manuscript. That, as they say, is romance, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, very nice indeed. Great reading from Ella and Chick Webb. And another vocalist, but um, I'm not going to say who that is. It could be. I don't think it's Chick himself, as far as I'm aware. Doesn't sound like him in any case. But... I'll reserve judgment on that one. we better have our bit of Cole Porter, haven't we? We haven't had our Cole Porter yet. And here is a favourite of mine, though, Cole Porter-wise. Miss Otis regrets. <laughs> James the butler calling. Miss Otis regrets she's unable to lunch today. Madam, Miss Otis regrets she's unable to lunch today. She is sorry to be delayed, but last evening down in Lover's Lane she strayed. Madam, Miss Otis regrets she's unable to lunch today. When she woke up and found that her dream of love was gone, Madam, she ran to the man who had led her so far astray. And from under a velvet gown, she took a gun and shot her lover down. Madam, Miss Otis regrets she's unable to lunch today. When the mob came and got her and dragged her from the jail, Madam, they strung her upon the old willow across the way. And the moment before she died, she lifted up her lovely head and cried, Madam. Miss Otis regrets she's unable to lunch today. Miss Otis regrets. One of the original, I think that was the original version, in fact, Douglas Bing from High Diddle Diddle, a review that opened in October of 1934 at London's Savoy 
Theatre. Cole Porter, of course, writing the lyrics. Um, as you can gather, it's a pretty tragic old uh, number, it has to be said, regarding a lynching. Um, yes, who'd have thought you could? I mean, obviously, we do think about things like uh, Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday and such like, uh, going back to these tra- tragic and terrible racist, racist acts, which did happen, and uh, I dare say still do, although we don't hear quite as much about them. It's a song began, it is claimed, during a party at the New York apartment of a Porter's classmate from Yale, Leonard Hannah. Hearing a cowboy's lament on the radio, Porter sat down at the piano and improvised a parody of the song and retained the referential song's minor-keyed blues melody and then added his wry take on a lyrical subject matter uh, in the country music, the regret of abandonment after being deceitfully coerced into sexual submission. Miss Otis, of course, is a polite society lady in the song about the lynching of this woman after she murders her unfaithful lover. Truman Capote, in an article published in November of 1975, relates a story Porter told him, saying, Porter used Miss Otis as a punchline in the 1950s, opening the door to dismiss a presumptuous man from his home. Porter handed him a cheque as he said, Miss Otis regrets she's unable to lunch today. Now get out. (laughs) Fats Waller also uh, used uh, it in his song Lulu's Back in Town with the same sort of wry humour. Miss Otis regrets he won't be around. Pretty sure Fats changed it to Mr. He didn't mind messing around with the words or the sex of the players. Or anything else for that matter. That's more or less it for another week. Hopefully you can hold on till next week. Take care whatever you're doing. Look after yourself and look after others as well. Same time, same place, next week. We'll see you then. Cheerio. Cheerio.